Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser. Welcome to the Hauser Next Center here in Fort Myers, Florida. Going to talk about cerebral spinal fluid. What led to this talk was, you know, I'll, I'll get patients who come in saying they think they have a cerebral spinal fluid leak, you know, which, you know, does occur. Uh, the cerebral spinal fluid surrounds the brain. It surrounds the spinal cord. It surrounds the nerve roots. It surrounds the cranial nerves. It surrounds the uh, brain stem. So the cerebral spinal fluid is very important and there's a normal flow to it. And believe it or not, the, one of the main pumps of the cerebral spinal fluid is actually subtle neck motions. Like part of it is also the difference between the blood pressure in the arterial and venous system and breathing. Like there's changes in pressure in the thoracic cavity with breathing. But they found with further research that you don't realize like there's all these subtle neck motions. So I think the pump, if you will, the pump of the cerebral spinal fluid is in the upper cervical region or the cranial cervical junction. So when a person gets ligamentous cervical instability and the muscles clamp down, like the muscles clamp down here, guess what happens? You just don't move you don't move your neck as much. You don't, you know, you, you know, you're just very static. So that's one of the things that impairs, in my opinion, the cerebral spinal fluid flow. So this over here is a cervical lordotic curve with normal cerebral spinal fluid around the brain, the brain stem, and the spinal cord. So the blue here is the cerebral spinal fluid. And when you get, see, see how this is like a reverse C, and then this is more like an S. So when you have ligament damage in the neck, the neck structure breaks down, which we call cervical destructure. And basically you're gonna get disruptions in the cerebral spinal fluid flow, or you might call cerebral spinal fluid blocks. And those blocks then, just like a river, if you dam up and the fluid flow in the river is impaired, it's just gonna be flooding all over. So basically when the cerebral spinal fluid gets blocked here, you're just gonna get fluid accumulate in your brain stem, in the brain, and it can cause any sort of symptoms. On MRI, what you can see is the ventricles, which contain also the cerebral spinal fluid. And when the ventricles enlarge, that's called hydrocephalus. So basically I'll have, it used to be when I did my residency, so I did my residency at Heinz VA Hospital in Maywood, Illinois, so hi to all the folks over at Heinz VA Hospital. Great, I got great training there. So the veterans there, I, we often, like in the 70s, when they were in their 70s, we'd see hydrocephalus. Do you know now, I see people, I see 20 year olds, 30 year olds, 40 year olds, that the MRI reports don't, sh don't say that they have hydrocephalus, but compared to a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old, what a, what a normal MRI is, they have hydrocephalus. So if you have blockage of your jugular veins, if you have blockage of your jugular veins or you have a cerebral spinal fluid block, you're gonna get the cerebral spinal fluid backed up in the brain and that's what causes the hydrocephalus or an increase in the ventricular volume. Well, the cranium, the cranial vault, the bones, that's an enclosed space. So what's gonna happen as the fluid volume increases, it's gonna put pressure on the brain. So we document non-invasively high brain pressures by doing pulsatile index of the arteries in the brain, specifically the middle cerebral artery. When the pulsatile index is high, that means the arteries are pulsating against higher pressure. And then we do optic nerve sheath diameter. When the optic nerve sheath diameter in general is over 6.1, that's indicative of a brain pressure greater than 20. Normal eye pressure or optimal eye pressure and brain pressure is 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. So obviously you could see when the fluids like this, probably the pressure on the brain is going to be high. And of course, if the brain pressure stays high for too long of a period, you're going to get degeneration of the brain or brain atrophy, 
where you're going to get death of brain cells and when that occurs too much it's called atrophy so when you get brain atrophy that's what causes Alzheimer's or various kinds of dementia so the fluid volume increases the brain volume decreases and ultimately that's going to cause cognitive decline brain fog and various forms of dementia so if you're someone who has brain fog or you're starting to lose your memory, I'd really encourage you to get evaluations of your neck structure and see if the jugular veins are getting compressed or you have a cerebral spinal fluid block. And then of course, do treatment directed at the neck, restoring the fluid flow from the brain to the body and the body to the brain, like the fluid flows normal, that will reduce the pressure and it should at least stop the cognitive decline and hopefully uh, as the brain pressure goes down and the brain physiology gets restored, the brain will repair itself. And that's another thing that people don't realize, like they found that even people in their 90s, they have the capacity to regenerate the, uh, the brain. So this is just my belief and I think the science uh, shows this is that if structures in the body, including joint structures, brain structure, liver, all this stuff, if they have the normal pressures on them, they have the normal pressure, they have the normal blood supply, they can get rid of waste products, the body has unbelievable amount of regenerative capacity and that's kind of the philosophy of regenerative medicine, right? We, Dr. Hauser, Danielle, the office here, we're regenerative medicine specialists. Every day the body's trying to regenerate. So if you have a joint that's degenerating or you have a brain that's degenerating or you have a spinal cord degenerating or you have an organ system degenerating, you have to find out the etiology of it. And if you're somebody who's responsible with your health, you try to be positive, you eat healthy, you know, you try to be a loving, caring person, it's likely there's probably some kind of structural problem that's increasing the pressure or disturbing fluid flow into that organ or out of that organ, into the brain, out of the brain, that's probably causing the degeneration of that organ. Because sometimes we forget everything that goes into the brain has to flow through the neck. Everything that goes from the brain to the body has to flow through the neck. So the neck's kind of the highway. If you want to say it another way, it's kind of the epicenter of all the things that go on in the body. You know, so if you have ligamentous cervical instability, you might say, well, why would I have that? Well, you could be somebody who's never been in a car accident, never had a, a sports injury, but you could simply be somebody like, like most of us addicted to your cell phone, or you have a job working on the computer, right? What is it? I don't know what the statistics are. What is it? Over 50% of the people now, their job is primarily on the computer. So it just means that if you don't have your computer up and you have your computer down, that means you're looking down, that's stretching the ligaments in your neck, like you're actually in the process of getting ligamentous cervical instability. You know, you go into Starbucks, you go into a coffee house, you go to the airport, it's like awful. Everybody's like that. You could simply just have prism glasses, right? Put prism glasses on you, then when you're looking at your cell phone, your neck posture is good. But basically, serve Vocal etiology of cerebral spinal fluid leaks. So one way the ligamentous cervical instability affects the cerebral spinal fluid is by blocking, but you can also get a, a cervical spinal fluid leak. So you have the spinal cord or you have the brain, then you have the fluid, then you have membranes around the brain, but the main one is called the dura mater. So you have this connective tissue tube, if you will, that's keeping the fluid in there. So if you've had uh, cerebral spinal fluid leaks and they're having trouble figuring out the cause, it may be because you have ligament issues. So when you have ligament issues in the neck, the dura mater is going to have to move a lot more than normal, right? Because by definition, instability means the vertebrae move excessively. So again, you have ligamentous cervical 
instability. The structures of the neck are stretched more. Eventually, you get a cerebral spinal fluid leak because of increased force on the dura mater. Now, the problem with documenting this, it's very hard to document because you have to inject contrast into the cerebral spinal fluid, which is a myelogram, and a myelogram can also cause a cerebral spinal fluid leak. So sometimes you just have to assume you have it. Now you might say, well, how would I know I have it? Well, it's very difficult to know for sure that you have it, but if somebody's symptoms are like almost 100% resolved when they're laying down, but when they get up, they have this horrible head pressure, you know, that could be a sign of cerebral spinal fluid leak. So sometimes you have to just assume you have it and do a blood patch. So usually by the time people come to the Hauser Neck Center, they've already had multiple blood patches which haven't really resolved it. If I feel like somebody has a cerebral spinal fluid leak, what I'll do is I'll do prolotherapy for the ligamentous cervical instability, but we'll use a lot of blood. So it's kind of like we're putting the blood on the outside where a blood patch puts it on the inside, but we've had good results. I've had good results with that. Like I, we don't, I don't have the case here, but I just remembered a case where a lady, a patient of mine that was already a patient of mine, she got into a really bad car accident. And then I was seeing her, like I was one of the first doctors to see her and she had cerebral spinal fluid leaking out of her nose. Like you could see the cerebral spinal fluid leaking out of her nose. And I think she needed two prolotherapy treatments with blood and then it was resolved and it's been resolved for a long, long time. So again, cervical destructure or breakdown of the cervical curve can cause a cerebral spinal fluid block. Uh, ligamentous cervical instability can cause it if you have increased intracranial pressure. So what it means is that the fluids accumulating around the brain or the brain stem or spinal cord, then if you have ligament damage, it's moving too much. So the dura is getting stretched by the increased fluid that is inside it. So it'd be similar to like, well, just from the recent hurricane, Hurricane Helene, apparently there was a dam in Tennessee because of all the fluid, the dam broke. So, you know, in other words, the water pressure was so high, the dam broke, then that caused all kinds of other problems. So that's what can occur with ligamentous cervical instability. And ligamentous cervical instability has many of the symptoms of a cerebral spinal fluid leak. It's worse with being upright, brain fog, changes of hearing, visual distortion, light and sound sensitivity, nausea, neck pain, ringing of the ears, bloating, headaches, the whole gamut. So how do we determine, is it a cerebral spinal fluid leak? Is it a cerebral spinal fluid block? Is it a jugular vein block? Well, one of the ways we do it is by measuring the optic nerve sheath diameter. So when you have a CSF block or an internal jugular vein compression, cerebral spinal fluid accumulates around the optic nerve, which we can easily document by ocular ultrasound. When you have a cerebral spinal fluid leak, it means that the fluid's leaking out. So you wouldn't have this blue here with a cerebral spinal fluid leak. You would have, if anything, a decrease of cerebral spinal fluid around the eye nerve. And this is what it looks like from a brain MRI when you have jugular vein compression or a cerebral spinal fluid block, you have cerebral spinal fluid around this. This is just showing around the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe, as we all know, is heavily involved in intelligence, higher cognitive function like problem solving. If you're somebody who definitely has noticed that you're having memory problems or it takes you so much longer to problem solve or you're forgetting words, you know, it could be that these processes are going on and it's affecting your frontal lobe functioning. So how would you know whether your cerebral spinal fluid problem is related to the neck? Well, if you have clicking, popping, grinding of the neck, if you have neck pain, and if you have the other associated symptoms related to ligamentous cervical instability, such as fatigue, bloating, palpitations, cognitive decline, difficulty swallowing, ringing of the ears. If that seems to be you, and the average person that I see here at the Hauser Neck Center has around 10 symptoms. 
So somebody who has multiple symptoms, is it more likely that they have one underlying problem or they have 10 separate problems? And I think common sense would be they probably have one main problem and the main problem likely is related to the fluid flow into and out of the brain stemming from some type of structural neck issue. The way we document structural neck issues is by digital motion x-ray, which is a motion picture of the neck vertebrae while a person moves the neck, upright cone beam CT scan, and we document the pathophysiology of that by a process we call neck vitals analysis, which involves measuring the eye pressures because eye pressure correlates with brain pressure, optic nerve sheet diameter, which we talked about, pulsatile index, which relates to how much pressure the arteries in the brain have to pulsate against. We also do internal jugular vein measurements in different positions, as well as does a person have a vagus nerve degeneration, which is common with all of this. And then the treatment is based upon the structural neck analysis. So we find that many people have a breakdown of the neck curve or they have cervical instability. So by correcting the neck curve and resolving the ligamentous cervical instability by prolotherapy, by tightening the ligaments, that the symptomatology resolves or significantly declines.